Hello, everybody. I'm Matt Anderson, and welcome to The Road Not Taken, how ordinary people got out of their own way, and you can too. Our guest today is Michael Venable. And Michael, I'm going to turn it over you, to you to introduce yourself to the audience. Excited to have you. Matt, thank you so much for the time today. Um, yes, I am Michael Venable. I'm a uh, State Farm insurance agent uh, in Kentucky. Uh, I've been doing this for about 18 years. Um, and one of the things that I think the reason we're here is when I first started, uh, I kind of got a letter from State Farm that said, you're not going to be good at this. We'll probably have to terminate a relationship. Um, so with that chip on my shoulder, I've since been able to achieve all the top levels of travel and all the pin plaques and awards and actually even risen to uh, the million dollar round table, which is the top 1% of financial professionals in the world. Um, so going from someone telling me I wasn't good enough, we have to terminate to be at the top of the industry. Thank, thanks for sharing so, that, Michael. And, and I know it's not easy to dive in with the sort of the jugular cut to the chase kind of reasons to listen straight off the get go, especially to talk about yourself in that way. Um, really, really keen to hear more about that difficult start and, and, and maybe my first question relates to that but I always like to kick off with a specific question so which is you know you know if you had to pick one thing and that's uh, that's helped you most in terms of getting out of your own way what, what would you say that's been I would say the biggest thing is having the ability to change your mindset um, our culture continues to tell us what we can and can't do but we have to stop allowing others to tell us and start speaking to ourselves. Um, the most powerful voice that we hear is the one that we speak to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, faith is very big to me, and Romans 12, 2 is my life verse. And it says, don't conform to the customs of the world, but allow God to create you into a new being by changing the way that you think. Then you'll know his plan for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. And so by allowing God to change the way that you think, and all things are possible. And so that mindset change is is the one thing that has differentiated me from the other 19,000 State Farm agents out there that are plenty successful mm -hmm. in helping to serve people. But it's that mindset um, of thinking differently. And I don't want to be like everybody else. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting thing you just said. Um, I, I've got to write that one down too. I don't want to be like anyone else because – I think that's how everybody feels. And yet, as you say, most of us are so influenced by the culture we live in that we unwittingly become somebody that or half of our real selves, I think. Um, I don't want I just want to write that down for a second. I don't want to be like anyone else. I also am going to ask that you reread that um, that passage from Romans. And I mean, just for those listening, you know, often, you know, faith comes up from time to time. It's 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 seldom an initial thing that someone brings up. Um so, so I don't want. I want to make sure that, that people listening aren't afraid that the whole piece is going to be about one, you know, one specific faith. But I do want to talk about that more, Michael, because it's, it's not one of my great strong suits personally. Um, and I want to hear from someone for whom mm -hmm. it makes a big difference because I know I'm sure many people listening also have strong faith, but but not everyone does. But I, I don't want to be like everyone else. But I want to come back to that quote from Romans because it, it, it was actually quite long. I couldn't write it all down. But you said, "Don't conform to the customs of the world," and then. Can you a bit a bit slower read the rest of it? Because it, it's I mean, regardless of what the source is, and it's it's a great it's a great source, but it, it's you know it's the content of the language that I, I most want you know everybody listening to ingrain. Exactly, and one of the beauties of it is I don't have to read it. It's it's inside, <laughs> okay. so it just kind of comes out. But it says, "Don't conform to the customs of the world." Okay. But allow but allow God to create. Well, okay. Do not. Conform the customer world, allow God to create you into a new being by changing the way that you think. By changing the way you think? Then you'll know his plan for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So I've got to ask, again, to bring this to life, can you share an example of something that's happened in your life where you've really needed to apply this to help you i mean you could, would, i guess it actually it would make sense to start did you you did you apply this when you got that letter from state farm actually looking back yes but at that point in time that wasn't the key thing that when i got that letter it was more of an arrogant um kind of okay i'm going to show you okay i had a chip on my shoulder like okay because there was another guy in town that started at the same time and he was able to get his contract from State Farm and hadn't performed near anywhere close to where I performed. 
And so I was kind of perplexed on, okay, what did I do to make someone upset Uh to give me this letter and extend my contract and all that? So in talking to a lot of folks, one, one thing that I've been very strategic about since I've started is to make sure that I surround myself with people that are positive. Mm-hmm. Um, again, with the negativity in the world, everyone will jump on that train, but those are people that I'll, I'll still care about them, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time and invest a lot into them because all I'm going to be getting back is going to be negativity. Mm-hmm. And, and my positive nature sometimes can't overcome that. And so I've got to learn to be able to spend time with those that, that I need to spend time with. Um, and so, because a lot of those folks were pointing, going, Michael, you ought to be mad. You just ought to, okay, get your contract and just shut down, show them. Mm-hmm. And I realized that I'm not going to affect State Farm. I mean, the only thing that I'm going to affect is me and yeah. my family and my customers and my clients and my team. Um, I'm, I'm big on serving. I mean, that's kind of our vision here in our agency um, is there's three things we need to look to do every day. And that's look for opportunities to serve our clients look for opportunities to serve each other on our team and look for opportunities to improve yourself. Hmm. We have to continue. I teach a, uh, there's a, a nonprofit here in town that helps folks who are in need. And if they've had to come back numerous times and they have to come to me for a budget class. Um, and last week they actually came in, I was walking through the process of budgeting and um, just very basic. The woman's like, well, I mean, I deserve to get my nails done. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't deserve anything. Oh, yes, I do. And so, again, that mentality is overtaken a lot. And so I think sometimes people look at people in their success and say, well, I deserve that. Mm-hmm. Well, have you done anything to deserve it? Have you put forth the effort and the work? Um, you can't cheat the grind. That's something I, I read a lot of books. And one thing I heard later, you can't cheat the grind. So sometimes you just have to put the work in and, so that's what, with my success in my agency, I mean, I started and, I mean, I didn't start out a superstar. Mm-hmm. I've seen friends of mine that have gone straight to the top. It took me about eight years. Yeah. Um, I, so I've got to stop because there's so many yeah. things here I want, to, I want to ask you about. And I imagine people listening have questions too about some of these things. I hope I, I respond to some of them. You said something about, like, I make sure I surround myself with positive people. How have you done that? You have to be very intentional. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that if we feel our, if we are led by our feelings, we'll often be deceived. We have to make decisions because um, if anybody exercises, sometimes you don't feel like getting out of bed and going for a run. <laughs> you have to make the decision to be able to do that. I'm laughing because that's how I felt this morning. Sorry, yes. <laughs> yes. But with anything in life, we have to be conscious about the decisions that we make. And one of those decisions is who we spend time with. Mm-hmm. We've all heard that you become the five people that you spend the most time with. Yeah. Um, so I try to surround myself with people a whole lot better than I am. So Mike, I've got, I've got to, I want to pin you down though. So how, you said I have to be very intentional. Go deeper than that. Like specifically how, like in other words, do you call up other top producers you don't know and say, can we have a study group? Like what, how intentional do you get on this? Yes. I mean, I, I try to invite myself. Um, there's a meeting next week in, or a couple weeks in Nashville that last year, actually, I didn't qualify for it, but I invited myself to dinner with some of the top, I mean, top 50 agents in the country. Okay. Because uh, that's one of my goals. I've been in the top 100 out of 19,000, but I've not hit that top 50 yet. Okay. That's the one, one pin plaque and award that I've not accomplished, but I will. Um, and I, I always tell folks, one of, one of my goals was to hit exotic travel which is one of the levels of awards that they have. Yeah. Well, it took me 14 years to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Did that mean that I was a failure 13 years? No. It meant that I just hadn't reached my goal yet. Mm-hmm. And I think so often we get caught up. If we don't hit a goal instantly, like our culture tells us, everything should be instant and now, that we're a failure. And that is by no means, I mean, I, I'm not a failure. Right. It just took me longer than some to get there. I also want to ask, and it's okay if you you don't even know, know what, what what to say to this one, but you know why? When I, I I for some reason, still when I think of personal development, I I I have a difficult time blending what you said about um, you can't cheat the grind about blending hard work and spirituality because I feel like whenever I pick up the books in the spiritual section, um, the message seems to be almost 
it seems to be almost the opposite. In other words, you know, you don't have to work so hard or try too hard. That's part of your problem. You know, what you really should do is sort of release your energy into the universe. And I'm not trying to be facetious because I, I know I believe that I know I believe in vibrational energy between people, but but that or you should have more faith in things beyond you but how do you blend those two because you clearly are a very spiritual person and you also are very pragmatic about knowing that there are no easy fixes so talk about that well and actually one of the things that i do my morning ritual is i spend time in in the word in the bible and doing a bible study well in there's a book of the bible called james Mm -hmm. and in that he talks so if you say you have faith but you do not have works then where is your faith? So the Bible does tell you, you have to put these things into action. And because I can tell you all day about my faith, but if you don't see it enacted in the things that I do on a daily basis, then it's really meaningless to you. Because faith really does come down to serving and loving others. So so where does it blend or connect with the thoughts part? In other words, you know, that if you're thinking certain things, they're more likely to happen. If it stays top of mind, it's more likely to happen. Talk about that. Well, and again, changing your thought process, um, a lot of times it's just thinking bigger. So one of the, one of the milestones in my agency was in 2008. Um, I'd been to a, a, like a little annual kickoff meeting and I always been a decent agent, done a pretty good job. And we had a scorecard that were ranked on certain things. And uh, another agent who had done a good job, she's like, Michael, what are your what are your goals? And I was kind of hitting midway for the on the scorecard. And she's like, Are you stupid? And I said, Well, no, I'm not stupid. I mean, I'm Michael Venable, come on. And she's like, Why aren't you setting your goals at the maximums? I'm like, I, I don't know. Maybe I am stupid. So I merely that year I came back and I changed all my goals to those maximums. So I changed my mindset. And also that year, I was invited to a, a mutual fund leaders meeting that I did not qualify for. But I guess I'd gotten enough that I was a guest attendee. And that was the first time I was able to be around the top 10 agents in the country. Mm-hmm. And it was then and there that I realized that they were not any smarter than I was. Mm-hmm. Their markets were not any better than I. They simply thought different. They thought bigger. And so I came back, and really from 2008 till now, my agency has done nothing but skyrocket. Okay, that, so that was the pivotal point. Now, now, Michael, this is a topic that excites me a lot, uh, even though you might not hear it in my voice or even see it if you're watching the video. But all I can do is explain my train of thought and, and assume and hope that many people listening can relate, and I want you to sort of, um, I guess, you know, talk, talk me through how you got past this. You said something like uh, there was a woman at this 2008 event that said, you know, why aren't you setting your goals at the maximums? And then you said, and so I changed my mindset. Well, that's hard to believe. Like for most people, I I think I really believe, I shouldn't say I really believe this, but my my experience as a coach of hundreds and hundreds of people has been that they can set big goals. I've set big goals, but I don't get very close to them. You know, in other words, then what starts to happen within a short period of time is that negative self-talk starts kicking in, usually unwittingly saying, ah, eh, you don't really deserve it. You know, there's no way you're going to make that much money. There's, how are you going to figure that out? Um, so how did you do that? Was it as quick as all that? Or like talk us through how you had success with that. Yes and no. But again, like you just said, the most powerful voice that we hear is the one inside our head. Right. And so that negative self, you, you have to make a choice not to listen to yourself or not to say those things to yourself. And it's hard. It's not easy. Um, again, I'll have a lot of folks that will call me and say, Michael, can you tell me what, what you do to be successful? I'm like, well, there's no reason for me to waste my time because you're not going to do them. So tell me about your family. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, I, so going back to the, the point about keeping negative people out of my space there's agents that, that are dear friends to me we don't talk business yeah because they're negative but i care about their family and i care about them and so you can differentiate those two okay. but you do have to draw lines so how do you catch that then because it, again to some people they might think oh, it's too simplistic to say you just choose you know it reminds me of the abraham lincoln quote which i now actually believe but i didn't used to, <laughs> to think it was absurd where he just said happiness is a choice and i'm thinking 
come on you know um but but um but how do you catch that thinking because i think that's in my mind that's what i see as the key and so tell me what else i'm missing or if that is the key you know because to to, to catch the negative thinking so that you can feed your brain with more empowered things like how did you um how did you build that process how did you keep it top of mind i think it goes back to that romans 12 too allow god to change the way that you think and it's i mean i i guess being a type A driven, I'm a three on the Enneagram, and I mean, I, I'm an achiever. I like getting stuff done. Yeah. So my personality is, okay, how do I get more things done and be more productive and help serve more people and accomplish those goals? Well, I realize that being around negative people doesn't do that. So it is just kind of a, yeah, sorry, I can't can't spend time with you on a business aspect well, well, so, hang on. but you're saying uh, that being around positive people was the most important thing because it kept your head in the right place is that what you're saying yes and oh absolutely you choose not to say negative things to yourself is that what you're saying that's a piece of it yeah yeah I mean, because what you allow in i mean part of the reason i, I mean i'm always reading a book and always trying to get better and i don't read crappy books I read the ones that are going to build me up and make me a better person. So you continue to put good stuff in. Now, I'm reading a book by Michael Hyatt, Free to Focus. Mm -hmm. It's 300 pages. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not going to get everything out of that book, but there's going to be a few things that are going to stick. And so it's, I mean, it's inches. I want to just get 1% better. And so over time, again, being around positive people, you're not going to instantly become like they are. But you're going to get 1% better, a little bit better every day, every day. And it has to be a constant focus. And, again, my constant focus is how do I serve people better? Because we all know Zig Ziglar, if you help people get what they want, eventually you'll get everything that you want. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that vision of serving others is what kind of drives us here in my agency. Well, you've covered a lot of different things here, all of which are really quite huge. Uh, and I say that not lightly. I mean, some of these have been like the major takeaways I've had from other interviews with people. Uh, like the 1% better piece was a philosophy that I heard about from a world champion athlete recently in an interview. And it was a beautiful way she described it, you know, in terms of how all the negative things, all the failures she'd had had been lessons learned that were like 1% of things that had built her own philosophy of getting her head ultimately in the right place but also th all the details in her life kind of like a four seasons experience like like that every every detail mattered if you wanted to be the best you had to pay attention to the little things including you know all the little all the little things you put in your body and the you know the, the little things in terms of how you do and don't spend time so that that piece to me was a masterpiece listening to that um so that and that too is part of the mindset as well. I think when you say it's inches, I think it's also for us, for everyone, it's about having, I suppose, realistic expectations that we can get there. But it's it's not an overnight success. It's going to be gradual. Um, one of the pieces I'm still struggling with, and of course this is partly because, without going to masses of detail, I, I had a very very um, very distressing experience as a boy with with religion. Um, it's a long story. I was kind of trapped in this choir that they wouldn't let me out of. And so it, it left an extremely negative taste in my mouth and I had very angry teenage years. Um, so I, I struggle around, around organized religion, but I, I know that there is, there's more to life in terms of the spiritual world than, than certainly what we see in front of us. I acknowledge that. I'm just going to give you a bit of context here, Michael, because it's yeah. quite sure very different from yours. But it was interesting that it was your first response when I asked you the question about, you know, you said you have to choose not to say negative things to yourself and it's hard. And I said, how do you do that? And you, and you said, well, it goes back to Romans and allow God to create. What was that? I can't read my writing. I'm writing so fast here. Allow God to create. God what? To, create, to create you into a new being. Into a new, oh, that's what it says. Into a new being. Right. So how does that, how does that relate? Because that, because because that, that, again, forgive me. Um, I maybe again, well, I'm, I'm trying to be too, um, I can't even think of the word now. I mean, obviously, there's multiple pieces that go into this puzzle. So it's the doing, but then the allowing God part. That sounds like faith, right? It, absolutely, it yeah. is. I mean, my faith. So the, the other big part of my story, um, let me jump ahead a little bit. So 2010, um, well, my wife and I got married, opened my agency, didn't 
she started wanting to have kids. I'm like, honey, we can't afford it. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was one of those, we were making about 60,000. I think I made 20,000 my first year. She was making 40. Our expenses are about 50 and she wanted to quit and stay home with her daughter. All right. And I'm like, honey, that flip flops, it doesn't work. And finally God kind of hit me between the eyes and said, look, you don't provide for your family. I do. I love your family more than you love your family. And so she quit and we've been fine ever since. Um, and so fast forward, uh, we had three kids. She always wanted to have four. She was the youngest of four. Mm-hmm. Um, we had three kids, had rough pregnancies. And so I'm like, look, I've got a piece with three. Let's just stick with three. And she did for quite a while. And she just felt felt called to start the adoption process. Again, me being financial-minded and financial planner, I'm like, honey, we don't have money. Adoption's expensive. Yeah. We don't have money. Again, God kind of hit me between the eyes and said, Michael, you still haven't listened. I'm the one that provides for your family. You don't do it. Okay. So I, I released control, which is one of those things we all really want. And the illusion of control is one of the, the biggest lies out there, I think. So we all want control. We, in, in reality, don't have it. So, but started the adoption process. Um, started the adoption process. We ended up adopting him from uh, Ethiopia. Our son, the youngest, his name is Scarborough, Ashenick Venable. Um, just to joy, so much fun. Um, so in the middle of that adoption process in 2010, uh, my wife ended up having, uh, having complications, thought of scoliosis, went to a doctor, said she had an Arnold Chiari malformation and was going to have to have a decompression surgery. So um, had a scary first ride, ended up having to have brain surgery, told my team, basically on a Tuesday, we found out she's going to have to have brain surgery. On Wednesday, she ended up having it kind of emergency-wise. Um, so I told my team, I don't know when I'm going to be back. So I really didn't come back to the office until about February. Um, we hit all the pin plaques and awards that we wanted to hit, again, because if you surround yourself with good people and you care about others, they will pour back into you. So my team, a lot of my success is not because of me. Um, it's because of the people that I surround myself with and the team that I've hired. Um, and the way I care for them, they're going to care for me. So then fast forward to 2011, we actually went to Ethiopia, picked up our son, um, brought him home. Um, my wife had a second brain surgery, and from there she actually had a, a allergic reaction to heparin and had a stroke and ended up passing away in August of 2012. So here I am, a small business owner with four kids. I've got a 14-month-old, um, brand new from Ethiopia, and it's like, okay, God, what do I do? Wow. So, again... The way that you think drives where you end up because the world would have rallied around me when I curled into a fetal position and said, woe is me. This is not fair. No one would have judged me. They would have fed into that and said, yeah, Michael, that's not right. But again, making choices, not based on feeling. Um, One of the analogies I use is, Matt, if I decided to give you a gift, you've got to choose to accept that gift, correct? Mm, Yeah. So... Well, I'm I'm a firm believer that God gives us the gift of joy every day. And the difference between joy and happiness, happiness is when something happens to you that creates a good feeling from external. Joy is internal. And God gives us the gift of joy every day. But we have to choose to accept that gift. Now, there were days after Beth passed away that I'm like, I don't want any part of that. Woe is me. I just want to sit here in bed. I'll get the kids off to school. I'll come back. This is horrible. I'm 38 years old. I'm an insurance agent. This doesn't happen to me. This happens to my clients, and they help protect me. <laughs> yeah. Because it never happens to us, does it, Matt? No, it doesn't. One day, then one day we wake up, and we're like, where the hell am I? Mm-hmm. This is somebody else's life. So, so, sorry to interrupt you. So yeah. is this a big... So, because for some reason, I and I, again for those watching this, I mean, I, I knew your wife had passed away, so I perhaps didn't look as surprised because I wasn't hearing this for the first time. But at the same time, for some reason, I thought she, I assumed she had cancer. So this this reaction then was this a, a this was a big surprise. Like it wasn't like was she was in like she was um in a terminal situation, right? Because I don't understand all the medical diagnoses you mentioned, but she'd had some brain no. surgery, but she was assumed it, she'd recover just fine. Oh. Oh, yeah. She was going to be completely fine. Um, um, forgive me for detail. What's, what is sepsis? Or ha- what, what was it She, she happened to her? Well, she had a stroke. Okay. And oh, so after, after what? She said... She they gave her... Hep- hep- yeah. Heparin is a blood thinner. Okay. And so oh. 
creating oh, blood. I see. Oh my god. Well, so her body had allergic reaction that oh. destroyed all of her platelets. Holy platelets god. are what helps your blood clot. So whenever she had a brain bleed, she didn't quit bleeding. And then her platelets were so low they couldn't do surgery. So it was a catch twenty two. So and the doctors were like, okay, wait, what's going on? Has she? Oh, I mean, god. when you're five five doctors working on her, whenever they life flight her to Nashville. And what was the timeline on this? Like, how quickly did this all happen? So she had her surgery the 1st of August, um, and we were home. We had surgery in New York, drove her home. Everything was great. Um, we were sitting at the kitchen table on a Sunday morning. The kids were at church. I was feeding her breakfast, and this was on the uh, 20th, I believe, of August. And she just started talking gibberish to me. And I'm like, wait, what's my name? And she couldn't speak, and so... Finally got her in the ambulance, got to the hospital, they life flighted her. Um, and basically, in Wednesday, we kind of figured out what was going on. Um, and so, Wednesday night, I saw her pupils dilate. And so, I kind of knew then, it's like, okay, Jeez. this this is not going to be a good ending. So, I asked the doctor, I said, how long can she be like this? He's like, Michael, she's perfectly healthy. I mean, she, she taught spin class, she taught aerobics. I mean, she was, she was fit. Um, he's like... She could last a week, a month, a year. It's we, we really don't know. Wow. And so then again, my prayer was, Lord, either heal her completely so that she can get up and walk out of this hospital or heal her completely and bring her home and to heaven. Yeah. And the, the worst fear I've ever felt in my life. Um, told the story a lot. You're going to get me. Sorry. Huh. Thursday night before she passed away. Um, I've never had fear overtake me like this um, to start praying and God God does not create a sense of fear and so God released me from that fear but he shared a, a somebody shared a passage with me and it's uh, Psalms 30 verse 5 though you weep in the evening joy comes in the morning so I had this peace come over me to know that she would be gone in the morning so called some friends of mine um, who I thought had gone home. They're like, we're not going home. We're going to the hotel. If something happens, call. So there were me and my sister-in-law and two of my best friends that were there when she passed away. Her official time of death was 6.14 in the morning. The official sunrise was 6.13. Hmm. So once again, God's word is true. Though you weep in the evening, joy comes in the morning. Because I could be joyful that she was completely healed. Now, another person that I listen to a lot is Dr. Kevin Elko. And actually this morning in our team meeting, we talked about it. And it's like, it's not what happens to you. It's what happens for you. And through that whole process of, I mean, again, I could have woe is me. I've lost my wife. This is not fair. But from that, because again, I'm going back to scripture a lot, but it's, it's the foundation of who I am. Yeah. And... Again, in, in Romans, it says God works for those works for good, those who are called according to his purpose. So, and so say I, that more slowly. God works, right? Let me read this one so it's a little bit more realistic real quick. Um, that one I tend to get out of line. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's more, it's more that I, I wanted to make sure I followed exactly what you were saying. Romans 8, 28, second. That's all right. Let me scroll down here. I'm particularly fascinated by this concept of what you just said about it's what happens for you, because that's not what I was expecting you to say. Um, and it, cause, Because everyone listening to this can apply that to their own lives. I mean, we don't have to have had such excruciating tragedy, um, but everybody's had pain and problems and challenges. And, um, and, and those are often the things that are what ultimately holds us back through limiting beliefs and what we don't, you know, think we're worthy of and therefore don't take See, and Go ahead. See, I'll disagree with you. Okay. I think those are the things that make us who we are. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that help define us. Because without going through that, I'm not half the man that I am today. Mm -hmm. So that Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So I cried out to God, and God can take you being angry. God can take any emotions. He's created it all. 
I said, God, I expect, I want to see good now. I don't want to have to wait 20 years and look back and go, oh, that's good. I want to see good now. So, so with that Facebook, people have been praying all around the world, been praying for her to be healed. And I firmly believe God answered that prayer. She was completely healed. And so instead of raising, I'm not a flower guy. So I'm like, please don't send me a bunch of stinking flowers if you're home. I said, let's give money to uh, a nonprofit. There's a nonprofit that I've I've worked with called Ordinary Hero, which is based in Nashville. Mm -hmm. They're an orphan advocacy group that works with kids in Ethiopia. Well, both of my two of my sons are from Ethiopia. Uh, I've told you about one. There's another one that got added, and I'll I'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, but I figured we could raise five thousand dollars, and so I put out there on Facebook, "Hey guys." Instead of flowers, let's go ahead and just give to Ordinary Hero. I think we can, you know, I like setting goals and reaching them, so I'm set the goal of $5,000. And that, that quiet, still voice inside me, which I kind of attribute to God speaking to you, was, are you not going to allow me to work? So I doubled the goal to 10000 And I put out there and said, okay, God, God said, aren't you not going to allow him to work? Because 10000 seemed unrealistic. So I did that on a Sunday night. Her funeral was Monday morning or Monday evening. And at the end of her funeral, we raised $13,769. And so from there, I changed the goal again to $25,000. Huh. We hit twenty-five, dollars an anonymous donor matched that to fifty, dollars And now we've raised sixty-five, dollars $66,000 in her honor. Now, it's not just about raising money because uh, – Kelly Putty's the the director of Ordinary Hero, and she's got an amazing testimony. But visiting with her, I said, Kelly, I said, I don't want to just give this money away. Let's invest it so it continues to give. Because when you invest, things grow. And when you give away, things die. So we ended up going to Ethiopia, and we, she had taken numerous mission trips over there and always had to find a hotel or someplace to stay. I'm like, why don't you have your own place? She's like, we've never had the money for that. So now there's an Ordinary Hero life center, a guest house in Ethiopia that has brought life to hundreds if not thousands of people. And that wouldn't have happened if Beth hadn't passed away mm -hmm. and people hadn't been led to give to be able to help serve others. So it's not about us. Mm -hmm. It's about serving others. So I mean, that's, that's kind of what got me through is knowing that there was going to be good come from this but again, going back to that verse in James talking about, we have to put our faith into action. Well, that action is I went to Ethiopia. We went to find kids to help. We went to go find a bill. I mean, we have to do things. We can't just talk about things. We have to do them. And so actions are what are important. I want to come back to a couple of things. You, you said that um, well, something I'd said around limiting beliefs and past pain. You said I disagree with that. And I, I, I just um, I'm curious what it was I said that you well, that you were reacting to? I think you had said the point, well, people think that they can't do stuff mm -hmm. and they're limited and that kind of stuff. I disagree. Or the bad things that happen. That's what it was. It was the bad things that happen in people's life and that's what limits us mm -hmm. and um, causes us not to be able to achieve certain uh -huh. things. Got it. Okay. And you're saying... Right, but I just... And, yeah. And you're saying that we should use that, stuff. right? Yeah. So the... I like speaking in analogies people can grab. So if you're to bake a cake, it requires flour. Would you like to eat flour by itself? Hmm. No, it's bitter and nasty. What about just salt by itself? No. Or vanilla. Now, the sugar you probably could eat by itself. But the raw eggs, eh, not big on that. But when you put it all together, it's a sweet treat. And that's kind of, the we all, every one of us, is going to have tragedy in our life of some sort. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of that bitter stuff. But when you put it all together, it can create something sweet if you do it right. Because, again, a cake, you can screw a cake up where it's not good. But if you put it together correctly, you can sell it for a lot of money and people are going to come and we use that to celebrate. Clearly, you've benefited greatly from your faith in helping you build that strength or that knowledge as well i think to deal with incredibly difficult things there's two things i want to ask and i don't know which where, where, where how exact where to start i mean like, i want to kind of stay on what we just talked about You're like so in other words you're saying that 
the key or one of the keys is to 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 build that those those painful experiences and combine them with the sweet stuff, the good stuff, the great skills, but to see it differently, to see it not as a crippling thing that's holding us back, but to see it as another piece that defines some level of greatness that we can achieve. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. I mean, my childhood, my mom and dad divorced when I was four. My mom got married a couple other times. We moved around a whole bunch and didn't have a lot of stability. I mean, my mother loved me and she's a good mom, but it, it wasn't a perfect childhood. And I can look back on that and say, yeah, that, that just wasn't fair. I mean, I had to move so much. That's created me. That's created who I am. I had to be quick at being able to adapt and meet new people and make friends pretty quick because mm-hmm. I might be gone somewhere in a couple months. So, or we moved to Georgia and four months later I had to move back. Well, how do I explain that to all my friends? Why'd you move? Well, mom found a guy, chased a guy for a couple months. That didn't work. So how, how do you work through that? So that kind of helped create who I am. And I think if you if you look at things through a different filter of, okay, how has that created who I am? Because God's created each of us individually mm-hmm. through those things that we've gone through. And it's not all good, but it all goes to create who we are. And we can use that for good. And then where'd you get the fuel from? Because that's the story, but the story still needs um, input or uh, momentum. I don't know what, uh, that's just, I don't know how to give that to somebody. One of the most difficult part about my job is, is hiring team members that have drive. I, I don't know how to create drive yet. If I could, I would be a multi-billionaire because I could solve a lot of the world's problems by creating people who have drive to get things done. You, you, and can, you absolutely can, and we'll, we'll have to have that conversation another time, I think, because that's part of the work I'm doing is... I mean, to me, that's the first, that's the foundational layer, I think, is, I think, I think a lot of that drive can come from telling the raw truth about your situation. And that's what some things you were talking about. I don't know if you've heard of David Goggins, but uh, he wrote a book recently called Can't Hurt Me. And that's kind of his, his first challenge in his book is you've got to tell the raw truth about everything that's really going on and not sugarcoat it. And, and if, and if you feel horrible pain, that's, that's a good thing because that's what's going to drive you to say this is unbearable. Um, a guy I interviewed a couple of weeks ago said I got to the point I was so disgusted with where I was in my life. That was what prompted me to then go off and, and achieve great things. And he did for the rest of his life. Um, and, and yes, there's more to it than that. But that, that's the very first thing that I think everybody needs to do. So I do think there are answers to that. I was just curious. Well, I also wrote down the words inner strength because every story you've told starting – well, now you've told some childhood stories, but I mean, originally it started with the letter from State Farm that you there's an element to you where you aren't going to be told you can't do something. And I'm curious where that comes from. That's an interesting question. I don't know if I've ever pinpointed where that comes from, but kind of my innate desire is I, I like... I've said recently that I tend to have um, unrealistic expectations, okay. but I have them enough that they happen. Um, example being, I built our house on our farm about, about four years ago, and uh, I was able to buy some land from our family farm. They were having the family meeting. I wasn't there. I was actually working on the house. And uh, so my, we started in June, initial goals to be able to have the house done. Christmas on the farm was kind of the little mantra in our house. Well, we got it framed very quickly. So I said, told my, my new wife, Sarah, I said, tell your parents, tell them they're coming for Thanksgiving. She's like, what? So I said, tell them they're coming for Thanksgiving. She's like, there's no way you're going to. I said, tell them they're coming for Thanksgiving. And so my son, who was 12 at the time, was at this meeting, and they were talking about when the house is going to be done. And my dad's like, yeah, Michael wants to be able to get done by Thanksgiving. They're like, well, that's, not unreal. that's kind of unrealistic. And my 12-year-old said, well, there's reality, and then there's dad's reality. <laughs> so, so he kind of gets it. So hopefully I'm shaping my kids to be able to change their thought process and to think bigger. Because who would have thought you could build a house in less than five months? Mm-hmm. And I was able to build this house in less than five months. We, we moved in the weekend before Thanksgiving and had the whole family over, and it's a great memory. So, And I want to ask more about the faith piece. 
in that. Well, I'll go, I want to go back to the fundraising example yeah. after your wife passed away. Um, or it's actually the com a couple of comments where you've said something about, well, you know, I I'm going to be the one that's providing for your family. And, and I can't help but not think from a pragmatic standpoint, <laughs> okay, that you're, you're going to be the one that's doing that work. I, I mean, this is what's going through my mind. You know, um, how? Because what I'm, what I'm thinking is I don't want people to set themselves up for, for too bad of a failure by having too big of a goal. Because that's what most but that's what happens for at least in my life experience um that is a you know most people do better with small increment incremental goals rather than huge ones and that only a tiny number of people can really set huge goals and achieve them like the richard bransons and i don't know people in, in that world elon musk right. let's say but but most people have found it again it's just my life experience where it's too demoralizing and and of course, I'm also thinking about myself here as well. Of course, I want huge goals. And yes, I'd love to smash them all. That would be wonderful. Um, and so I'm looking to, for, for, from you to talk through a bit more of how you make that happen without getting defeated in your own mind. Uh, and I think, so yes, when I say that God provided for my family, yes. But God is not a genie in a bottle that you rub it and he pours blessing no i mean there's still where he's given me abilities he's created me in a unique way i have to go use my unique abilities to be able to get that done but there's still that underlying faith on okay because there's numerous occasions i can i can tell a lot of god stories on how something happened mm -hmm. and it wasn't i mean a non-believer say well that's a coincidence yeah but someone with faith looks at it and goes okay I can see. I always say that my God vision is twenty twenty. Looking back, mm -hmm. looking forward, it's I'm blind because that's what faith is. Right. But looking, forward, I can see where God had worked in there. So it, it's yeah, it's still me getting things done, but it's not. It's re releasing control, and it that's kind of one of those hard things. Yeah, you're releasing control, but yet you're still in control, kind of. Um, and again, that illusion of control, I think people, I think that causes a lot of people to fail because they think they are in control. And it causes a lot of people not to fail, but to fall. I've seen a lot of successful people that take it a little bit too far trying to reach that and start doing things the wrong way. Yeah. Because they think they're in control and they're powerful. You, and then, then the fall. Do you, I mean, have you had experiences where you feel like you've tried too hard? Because I see that a lot. I mean, I've coached lots of A-types and I think that sometimes an obstacle for some of them and, and also and it's, it's interesting this is where i think it gets fascinating and well beyond my expertise is is in what we then project to others in other words where people can tell we're trying too hard so it comes across in our voice and in our actions and so it turns people off whereas what i hear from you is you set these big goals and there's a certain part of you that's at peace with well i can't possibly control all the outcomes in achieving this i have faith that something and i'll use my language something bigger than me is going to help and you've but you've said very other very specific things about and i'll work really hard i will i loved it when you said i i have um, i have to use my unique abilities to get that done so it sounds like you have enough faith in yourself and also in your resourcefulness to get things done like you're going to figure out maybe different creative ways and then you do it, in, I'm trying to paraphrase this, and then you do it in the spirit of we're all about trying to help other people get more of what they want, whether it's your team in the office or people in your or clients. So so in other words, it has all these knock-on effects is what I'm right. trying to say. Uh, I'm trying to put well, the picture so I can get my head around it is what I'm trying to do. And again, the control goes back to, I think we do have control over two things. The way we act and the way that we react. And so... I can't control rates. I can't control whether a client says yes or no. I can't control any other business client. I can control the way I react and the actions that I take. And so, again, going back to the three things we need to look to do every day, serving our clients, serving each other on our team, and improving ourselves. Those are all things we can do proactively mm -hmm. and an action-based. We're not, we're not assuming that something's going to happen. So when you start trying to be in control of the outcome, I believe that's where we get into trouble. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. We don't, yeah. When we get too in control, try to control the outcome. Um, exactly. I love that. I, I needed that reminder today. Um, 
sorry, I wanted to write that down. But I also want to ask you, because now this is the second time you've very, you know, verbatim talked about kind of the clarity of we, we're here to serve clients, serve our team and improve ourselves. When did you create that? Because the reason I'm, I want asking, because that this level of clarity to me, I'm noticing is very common in people that are at the top of their game. Like they know what they're about. They know what they value. They can explain it clearly. Um, and I think many of the rest of us are too foggy on those things. Um, but speak to how, you know, when you came up with that. It, it was probably a couple of years ago. Quite Again, recently, yeah. I mean, it hadn't been a forever thing. It's been within the last couple of years. And again, trying to get, I'm, I'm always trying to improve and get better. And one of the things is I've, I've got to be a leader of my team. Um, and having team meetings, I couldn't just go in there and say, let's look at the numbers and anybody got it. So I'm like, okay, what can we really rally around? And started doing some vision searching for our agency and what differentiates us and what could make us different. Um, and so that's really where that came because I realized, again, I know I'm going back to Scripture, but Jesus came to serve people. He was the Son of God and should have been served, but he came to serve. And if our goal is to become more Christ-like, then we just need to be able to serve and love better. He didn't come to judge. He didn't come to condemn. He came to serve. So if we can simply serve, then we're going to get better. So talk, talk about how that's helped you in sales, because, again, I don't know. I can't think of the, the most eloquent way to say this, but I think sometimes there's a and I have to use the word dichotomy, but there's an opposite intention in some relationships between really wanting the business, i.e. generating revenue from that person, and effectively selling them on something versus not necessarily serving their needs, because what you do, I mean, everybody needs what you have to offer. Um, but well, and that's what about that. Yeah, and so one of the things, like I said, I recently hired three new team members. So when I go through the interview process for call it a new business, a sales team member, I said the key thing here is we don't sell things in my agency. And I always get the eyebrow raised and the quizzical look, like, wait, you're hiring me to be in sales, but we don't sell things. I said absolutely not. We have quality conversations with clients. We help them identify the problems in their life, and we offer solutions. And if we have enough conversations, people people buy a lot of stuff from us. That's the reason we've been successful. But we don't sell things. Just my archaic definition of sales is if you've got something perfectly, like if you go to the car dealership and you drive up on a perfectly good vehicle, they're going to try to sell you a brand new one. Mm -hmm. Well, it's served the, the, the bottom line purpose of that vehicle is transportation. They both are doing it. So, So for me, again, it's... Another analogy, I try to help coach my clients on their swing, on their financial swing versus which club. Because every financial advisor out there is going to say, well, look at my club, look at my club, look at my club. I'm all about, let me teach you how to swing. Because then you can take any club and be successful. Because Tiger Woods, if I gave you his clubs, you're still going to suck at golf. So, But if I gave you his swing, you could go to the Goodwill and buy some old wood clubs and destroy everybody. Hmm. So, so again, yeah, we don't sell, we serve, and we serve by having quality conversations with our clients. And, and again, I, 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 this isn't really a, a great question. It's more me thinking out loud, but I'm assuming that people can pick up, people can pick up, right, when you're trying to sell them something versus if you're trying to help them. And do you, and, and do you think that's been the, again, another reason why you've been so successful in, quote, sales is because of your approach? I think so, because, again, I, I teach to my team, like, just have the conversation with people. Give them the opportunity to buy something from you. Show them the problem that we see that a lot of people are blind to the problems that we help protect or they don't want to see the problem. But if you expose the problem to them and show, here's the solution. It doesn't only cost that much to be able to get that, that problem taken care of. So the hard part with me getting my team is to have that conversation mm -hmm. because it's a little bit of extra work. It's not just auto and homeowners insurance mm -hmm. that they have to have. Right. It's the disability. It's the life. Right. It's refinance, restructuring stuff. It's saving correctly. I mean, so there's a lot of things going. Which, and those relationships take energy. Mm -hmm. And I've with my team, it's, I know it takes energy to have that extra conversation. Do you to be able to? 
Go ahead. Do you have a sort of a niche focus in your business? And I say that because you just said relationships take energy, which made me, made me think, gosh, that, that, that means that the numbers game is tricky in that regard because you can only have so many great relationships. And, and in your line of work, I know, well, I'm not an expert, but I mean, you, typically you need quite a lot of customers to do well in your line of work, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah we don't kill off anybody. It's, it's a law of large numbers. It's, we okay. make a little bit of everybody. Um, well, and that's part of being able to hire people and train them to speak the way that I speak and do the things the way that I want them done mm -hmm. is because they can build relationships. So my clients, there's, there's probably a lot of my clients that have never met me, hmm. but they, they know the culture of who we are. Um, and again, going, I joke and I say the older I get, the less I like people, unless it's the people that I want to be around. And I go back to scripture. Jesus had 12 disciples. That's who he poured into. Now, he loved everybody, but he really poured into 12. So I'm going to be like Jesus and just have like 12 folks that I really want to pour into. <laughs> so I jokingly say that, but yeah. I mean, the folks that I want to deal with are the folks who value their finances and value having a plan and value having professional guidance. Right. A lot of my clients don't. I mean, that's just not, but they still have the needs for other products that we sell. Mm. So there's different levels of, so we don't really have a niche. We want to serve those. We want to serve as many people as possible, but show them that there's other options for them if they want to better themselves. So I, I'm, I just briefly before we wrap up, I want to kind of hear about the bigger picture of either what you want to do more of in the future or, or also where you're impacting people because you've got your team. It sounds like you're very active in the, in the nonprofit uh, in certain capacities of teaching others, but you've got so much um, amazing energy that, and, and known wisdom that people need. How else are you imparting that and what's next for you in that regard? I don't know. That's a good question. I've I've kind of shared my testimony and shared my story in numerous places, and I've had a couple people reach out and say, you need to write a book. or do, I, I don't write. I'm a talker. So emails are painful for me. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep sharing my story because yeah. um, I kind of look at it as God's story. I'm just the one that was obedient and walked through it. Um, and it's to see how – let me fast forward a little bit. So after Beth passed away, I knew I wouldn't – we actually talked about getting remarried and that kind of stuff. And she, she was completely fine with it. I said, well, you're not going to die, so it doesn't matter. Well, she passed away. So I ended up did get remarried. And – I was very intentional in talking to my kids about when dad starts dating. What, is, what does this lady look like? They said, well, she needs to be pretty. She needs to like kids. She needs to love Jesus. I'm like, okay, great. So my prayer request was I want somebody single, never been married, no kids, okay with four kids, one of them brown, not from Hopkinsville, hmm. and not 20 years old. God brought me that woman. She met every one of those requirements. Brought me a 36-year-old, single, beautiful, six-foot-tall redhead that I always had the heart for adoption. Hmm. And so, and from that, we now have a fifth son that we brought over November of 17. Uh, Monty, he's a 17-year-old, a junior in high school. We're giving him the opportunity to be able to go to school and, I mean, make something. Giving him an opportunity. So, because we're nothing special. I mean, we got five kids. We yell and scream and we're crazy. I mean, we're, I don't have a perfect life. I have an awesome life, though. Mm -hmm. But it's not perfect. No. So. Well, Michael, it's, it's an absolutely amazing message. And you're definitely way too modest about how you've handled your situations to attribute it all to your faith. I mean, maybe I, 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 I shouldn't say, speak for what you, you, you've just said, but it, how you've handled things is so rare that you are a kind of a shining light for people regardless i think of their faith just because of the power of the message that you have to share i mean so you know anyway i maybe we can talk offline or, or you know if there's ways i can uh, help i would be that. interested i would be interested to hear more on that because again i don't think i'm special i just do what i do yeah well that that's what makes it work for people so i mean i talked to a woman yesterday um jenna Ben Shersha and, and her, you know, her podcast will be released the same week as yours, I expect, you know, and she was expected to die of cancer at, at 29 and, um, and then started a nonprofit. I mean, a story is, it's astonishing. And, um, 
and yet what made it what made her success so remarkable like she started a blog that was really just this private journal at first and then thousands of people started following it and it was not her intention she was not writing it to be you know the center of attention at all and it's the same kind of thing i think people are crying out for real people who are role models and um and have ways to be more effective in life and that's what the world needs more of in this day and age more than anything I mean, it's crying out for people like that so so yeah i would definitely encourage you to think about ways to um to share your message in in, in bigger ways and um hopefully this is the you know one start one piece to start to starting on that because it's it's amazing it really is i mean travis who introduced us you know he was understating if anything well he actually probably wasn't but again i regardless it's, it's sometimes until you hear stuff it's you know it's it's uh, you know i just knew he knew you well so sometimes that skews people's opinions as well when they really like someone and um who knows anyway but i know we need to wrap up here so um so so three final questions um who have you become since the day you opened that letter from state farm telling you you weren't up to being a state farm agent from a business standpoint i've become one of the best state farm agents in the country I know I'm the best state farm agent in Western Kentucky, um, and certainly the best state farm agent that my clients have. Um, as as a husband and a father, I've just become that much more driven to be able to provide a quality of life that that I desire for my family, so that we can have freedom to be able to do stuff. Um, this might be another little tangent, but again, on setting goals. I read a book called The Dream Manager, and I've got a dream book, and I actually wrote one of the things in there is I want to reverse time. I want to give away 90% of my money and live on 10%. Now, I might end up on my deathbed and never get there, but if I get to 60-40, that's a win for the way that money can be used. Because, again, what drives you? And Again, the money doesn't drive me, but the things that money can get done does drive me. Mm -hmm. so. And... Um... What would be a good first step for people to, I guess, get better in their work or to be more driven to provide more freedom for their family? I think you have to have a desire. Um, again, do not be led by your feelings. You have to make decisions. And generally, bottom line, I think God's all created us to be fairly knowledgeable of the things we know that we need to do. But we allow our feelings to drive us. Um, and you have to continue to get better. I mean, my office manager says all the time, a ship in the harbor is safe, but eventually the bottom will rust out. Mm -hmm. And so we have to continue moving, continue to get better. Um, you can't expect just sitting there and praying and saying, God, make me better. That, that's not going to happen. So there takes you, another little quote that I use all the time is action triumphs everything. I'd rather my team do something and screw it up rather than sit there and try to figure it out for two days. Right. So for those who have a desire to improve, start reading something, start putting good stuff in. Eventually good stuff will come out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. Thank you. And then lastly, how can readers keep in touch with you or learn more about you? Um, I'm on Facebook. Uh, just Michael Venable. Um, my email address is Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, at michaelvenable.com. Last name is V as in Victor, E-N, A, B as in boy, L-E, dot com. Mm -hmm. um, again, going back to your point, how do you plan to continue to spread this? I don't know. Maybe this is a launch pad that somebody will hear and say, would you come speak or do mm -hmm. something? And I would I'd be open to come to share, to share the story because – bottom line i looked at this opportunity as an opportunity to be able to serve others yeah no, i love it yeah. um we, we must talk more on that um anyway i know i know it's time to wrap up so thanks everybody well certainly firstly michael i i don't even know where to start with the thank you um <laughs> i feel really humbled to have, have, have been able to share what you've had to say because otherwise i don't know what you know there's no earthly likelihood i would have ever had a chance to hear what you had to say but also to get your perspective on things has been i think extremely helpful for me um and on many 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 levels so thank you so much um i can't wait to read back through my notes and start uh, figuring out how to plug these pieces into my own life more and with that for everyone else again the most important thing is taking 
a next step after this that you can't you'd have to have zero human emotion or um sensibility about you not to have uh, some good reason to take action um, after listening to this otherwise show notes are going to be on matt-anderson.com matt-anderson.com and um, please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already and leave a review and with that uh, i'm going to leave with my favorite question which is what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail i'm matt anderson and this was the road not taken